Hello, my DevNation friends. Welcome to another Tech Talk. And today's subject is about security. And to talk about security, to make us safe, we have a special guest. So I'd like to welcome Bill Bensing to the, this Tech Talk. Hello, Bill. Hey, how you doing? Uh, not bad. And how's the weather in Tampa? Sunny? It is, actually, it's overcast today, but it is warm. So I'll take the warmness, but we are a little overcast. Okay, warm is good. And yeah. have you been to Bush Gardens uh, lately? No, I haven't, but I'm right down the street from it. You believe, it's, believe it or not, like I'm right down the street, so I don't take advantage as much as possible, although I should, because it's okay. so much fun. Uh, no, I know the feeling that you could go anytime. That's why you don't go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Okay, so Bill, uh, what have you prepared for us today? All right, we are going to talk about uh, we're, we're going to talk about a love letter, and I'm not talking the type of love letter that would get you in trouble at your company. We're going to talk about a love letter from DevOps to security compliance and audit. Um, we're going to go through got some uh, some stories. We're going to talk about we're going to talk about Herbie's today, and then as well, we're going to give a uh, an implementation to show what we're doing in some upstream around automated governance um, and how people can get started with it. Sounds great. So let's see what you have for us. So uh, today, live from Tampa, Florida, and Cary, North Carolina, welcome to Dev Nation. Awesome. So I know this is a stream and people are going to ask questions. So the one thing I always like to start off with is like, uh, there's it's always conversations, no questions. So feel free to throw something in there. But again, I'm Bill Bensing, Managing Architect here at Red Hat. Um, I have to start off with a bit of an homage. Um, dear auditor, I recommend checking it out if you haven't checked it out. Um, this is the love letter, the love letter from DevOps to security compliance and governance and, you know, admittedly forgetting about them in the process. And so what we're going to cover today and what we'll go through from some a bit of philosophy, architecture and implementation is really how to make good on this love letter. So if governance is an issue in your organization, in highly regulated or, uh, it, organizations it always will be. Um, Hopefully, uh, you could use this, uh, even as it's recorded, as a, as a stepping stone into um, a next better relationship. So a bit of an introduction. Um, I do only have one rule, and I call it my Beyonce rule. Um, if you like it, then you should tweet on it. So make sure you hit me at Bill Bensing. A little bit about myself. Um, so I'm tacky enough to go ahead and quote myself all minute. But uh, things about CICD and software delivery. Uh, CICD is what we did yesterday. And I, I use that more as a sort of a, a reference point. Uh, we need a next generation of what we're thinking about doing when it comes to our SDLCs and software delivery capabilities. I like the concept of software factories. Um, it really reminds us that delivery needs to go beyond automation. It really should go to autonomous and at industrial scales. Um, so as I, well, you heard about the term software factory and some of that stuff today, this is a bit of my perspective on it. Um, some honorable mentions, um, I've had the great opportunity to work with John Willis, co-author of the DevOps Handbook. Um, he, uh, he has a, was it, he did the, uh, there's a Beyond the Phoenix project. He's got a big history, also one of the founders of DevOps Days, as well as Andrew Clay Schaefer. John and I have a large thought leadership around automated governance. Um, I'm standing on the shoulders of the giant that became before me there. Um, and Andrew and I talk about this in the context of a full SDLC all the time. Um, they are with the Global Transformation Office here at Red Hat. Um, a couple of folks, Kevin Barron, co-author of the Phoenix Project. Um, it's you, When we think about the some of the folks who have driven the community from where it started in 2009 and to where it's at today around DevOps, um, these are these are some of the big big characters there. And uh, just got to pay, gotta, just got to let everybody know, like as much as, much as I brought this together today, I definitely uh, spent a lot of time with these folks going through certain things. Um, one little mention, uh, what we're talking about today, bits and parts of it, is actually going to be released in a book coming out September 13th of this year, later on this year. So uh, John, I, a couple other folks uh, have written about eight, it was nine authors total, have written a novel in the uh, in the spirit of the Phoenix Project and the Unicorn Project. Um, and a bit we'll talk about today, the goal um, around automated governance. What we wanted to do is make automated governance relatable to a full organization, not just technical folks. Um, so there's pre-orders out there if you want to go check it out. And there's even some excerpts on the, the IT Revolution page. Uh, this book has actually come from a series of lineages from the DevOps Enterprise Summit. It started back in 2015, this unlikely union between DevOps and audit, and coming through what was in 2019, the DevOps reference architecture. So as I go through the implementation, we're going to give an opinion and implementation of this today, but the whole idea is people have been thinking and talking about this for at least the past seven years. 
So when we I'm mean, use the term modern governance and automated governance, automated governance is more of the implementation. Modern governance is this, this, this idea. And sort of have three concepts around modern governance where it's cooperation, not core kind of conflict, empowering those with the most context and removing subjectivity from all process. So this is sort of how we make what we're going to talk about happen today happen. But first, let's go ahead and get into the problem. Meet Herbie. I'm going to tell you this story, a bit of the story from a book called The Goal. The Goal is a novel about the theory of constraints. Uh, Phoenix Project was no homage to this, but we're doing with uh, Investments Unlimited, the same thing. It was written by Dr. Eliyahu Golrat. If you haven't read it, highly recommend going out and reading it. Long story short, Alex responsible for turning this manufacturing plant around. Alex has this Socratic influence, an old professor that uh, his name is Jonah. One day, Alex takes his son to a camping trip. His son's name is Dave. As Alex and other scout leaders are hiking with the boys, Alec, um, Alex is in the back. He's the trail and Charlie. He's the caboose. He keeps realizing that he's slowing down while the other Boy Scouts are, are, are speeding up. And as he keeps seeing this, he notices this, this is one Boy Scout, Herbie, who's right, right in front of him at the very end of the line. So every time the boys, Scout, boys uh, the boy Scouts would uh, speed up or they'd be going, the Boy Scouts would go in the same pace, Herbie would be slowing, and then Alex and Herbie would have to catch up or have everybody wait to happen. Um, as Alex is going through this, he has this massive realization, and this happens in the point where Alex is in the manufacturing pack trying to figure out what the problems are. And Alex is, realizes that Herbie, that to, to, to pace the system, to pace a system, he needs to take somebody like Herbie and put him in front. And so what does Herbie represent? Herbie represents a bottleneck. Herbie is a bottleneck for the Boy Scouts. And as you start thinking through manufacturing plans and governance, um, bottlenecks, these are things that slow the full system down. And there can only be one bottleneck at a time. And a vast majority of our current governance implementations are Herbie's. They're bottlenecks. And I'm not saying governance is bad. Quite the opposite. As a matter of fact, governance is good. Uh, what I'm preaching from the rooftops is that the current governance approaches are the new DevOps issue. So it could be back in 2019, 2006, like just that, just that core chronic conflict between dev and operations. Now we have a new core chronic conflict between governance and the rest of the SDLC. Um, these governance approaches, current governance approaches, they're an um, impedance mismatch between how socio-technical systems around the SDLC should operate to meet, um, to, to meet uh, feature scale compliance needs um, and how they currently operate. So what we need to do is sort of perform this relentless hunt for Herbie's um, and invest in increasing these capabilities. So again, long story short, highly recommend reading the goal about the bottlenecks. But at the end of the day, what you want to do is you find a bottleneck and you want to optimize the bottleneck. Optimizing any process around the bottleneck before or after is actually not good for the organization and a waste of money. Um, so what Alex came to learn that is regardless, of course, where the bottlenecks exist in the system, um, the bottleneck always sets the pace of the factory. It does not matter if the bottleneck's in the beginning or if it's at the end. And the best solution is really to start pacing your system with based upon how fast the bottleneck um, goes. And so if you caught that, some of you are probably thinking, holy cow, why would I slow my developers down just because, for example, my governance can't keep up with them? Well, I'm going to go ahead and walk through this and to explain to you um, what I mean by this. And so... When you, when you don't pace your system to the slowest part of the system, you get a lot of work in process. See, this is, this is a, this is a uh, it's manifested by a buildup of inventory. Um, and these are, you can see these because um, one, you may have like, for example, a lot of JIRA tickets awaiting something happen, JIRA or whatever tickets awaiting for somebody to execute them. That's work in process. Or you may just have a lot of people sitting around with their, sitting on their hands, not doing anything. A large work in process is a huge risk for an organization. I actually want to show you uh, with math how this increases your how, how this increases the risk to you and your organization. So let's start off with the perfect SDLC implementation. Um, I want to assume that from idea to production, all parts of the SDLC are harmonized and they can complete their tasks at the same rate. So for example, from development and QA into, uh, into governance and then supporting operations, there is no bottlenecks. They all operate at the same rate. 
And let's say, for example, this rate is four hours. So every four hours, the SDLC can put through a feature. Um, from historical data, this organization knows that each feature they put out has a 98% chance of success or really just a 2% chance of failure. So this failure rate includes all types of issues that could happen from putting anything new into production. Think about compliance, security. It could be a, a feature issue, but that's the, the failure rate. This means that at any point in time, their full risk of delivery issues is just 2% with the probability of 98% uh, 98 probab 98 probability of success. So let's think of this as the perfect one. Now let's get a bit more realistic about this approach. Let's say that your organization has good hygiene between dev and operations, um, but only these two folks. So therefore you can take the small chunk of work from idea to production in about eight hours. But before you actually go into production, you need to go through this manual compliance and security review. This manual review takes about 40 hours to complete. And it's not that there are people working for 40 hours. It's just that the time is 40 hours from when you submit your ticket to the time you receive pass or fail feedback. And I know for some folks right here, I said more realistic, they probably wish 40 hours was as quick as their turnaround would be. Um, but in the time it takes just to get one review done, you would have about five features awaiting for a next review. So for example, let's just assume that as good as a, the perfect folks were, um, let's assume your probability of failure is really the same as, as the perfect folks, the example before, let's just call it 98. Um, you can actually calculate your total risk by multiplying these individual risks and subtracting the value from one. This is what's referred to as, this is, this is this binomial distribution, geometric distribution. So if you take 98% or 0.9 and raise it to the power of five, what you're gonna get is roughly 0.9. What that means is because you have those five features waiting, the risk for those five features of the aggregated risk is 10% of, there's a 10% probability that you're going to have an issue. So it's not 98, it is 10%. So 0.9, so you have a 90% uh, chance of success. So that's just with this example. Um, so let's go ahead and now let's go to a governance process that, you know, probably is a bit more realistic. Um, let's go ahead and say that it takes 16 hours, 16 hours to get a new feature done. Um, that means that you have about 20 features in your, uh, 20 features to backlog because it takes 400 hours just for your governance process, which is two weeks for your governance process, just to go through and take one of the features or changes or whatever it may be. So with the probability of success still being at the 98% for ind per individual unit, and let's say you take this and raise it to the power of 25 you come out to getting a 60% chance of success, which means you have a 40% chance of failure. So independently, each of these, each of these applications could have a failure rate of 98 or a failure rate of 2%, but an aggregate because you're bulking these together and big change sets, now you're talking about a failure rate of 40%. Um, now think about more realistic measures of success and failure for an individual feature. I could almost, I would almost be willing to bet 98% isn't in the realm of where people operate at. It may be more than 90 or realistically 85. So if you take something like 85%, raise it to the power of 25. Now what you're starting to see is like you have less than a 50-50 chance of getting to production or operating in production as, that, as a big change set um, when you do it this way, as opposed to the, sort of this individual flow and pacing your system. And so this is a lot of setting the basis because what we're doing, and as we start thinking about automated governance, as we get into the technology, really, this is the why, is we're chasing Hermes. What we want to do is we want to address this governance bottleneck. And so let's go ahead and talk about how we address this governance bo bottleneck with modern governance. So we need to think differently. Uh, we need to modernize our governance approach, but we need to move from risk management models that rely on implicit evidence to ones that have explicit evidence and expect and enforce solely right on these explicit proof models. As we'll get in, and what people realize is, is you have these, you're, you're, you're handing your, 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 your commit, your feature over to some internal auditor. If you gave the evidence for what you did there to two different internal auditors, what's the probability that you expect to get the exact same result 100% of the time? Almost in most organizations is zero. They know they're always going to get something different, and that's because it's an implicit model. Um, this generates a lot of issues. Um, there's really two types of toil around. There's audit toil and there's delivery toil. So audit toil is just that, it's just the time it takes to do the audit. And then the delivery toil itself is the byproduct of not understanding the audit process 
or having questions that can't be completely answered. So think about slowing down or having to wait, you know, two days just to get an answer because you don't know where to go. So as we start thinking about what drives us, it is these audit toils. And this is, I like this because uh, MITRE, uh, what, what I'm talking about today around automated governance, they'll call continuous risk assessment. Um, this has actually come out of the DOD Enterprise DevSecOps Reference Design. If you check it out, highly recommend it. This is out of their strategy guide. But what you'll see here between sort of this model, the process is these, these little, uh, the, the little uh, diamonds in there. Those are the control gates. Majority of people's organizations, those control gates are manual. Those are what's causing in aggregate things like a 400 hour complete turnaround just to get a pass or fail. Now, if it takes 400 hours to get a fail, and you have to go back and keep doing some more, like now we see how the risk adds up there. Um, what I would do is introduce you a bit around the DevOps automated governance as a way to think about defining this. So as before we get in the tech, and I know it's Dev Nation and it's all about like, what can we do to get onto an IDE? But before we get into this, you have to think about designing the cooperation, designing the socio-technical system and how it operates. What I like about the DevOps automated governance reference architecture is that it has this this model, and I call it the IORCAs, but it's modeling out your inputs, outputs, risks, controls, actors, and actions for each stage of your software delivery lifecycle. So you can go from ID8 all the way to continuous operations, looking at each step, such as build, dependency management, um, testing, whatever those steps may be for yours. And you can assess what are the inputs to this, what are the outputs I expect, what are the controls, what are the risks that this that that this process um, prevents. What are the controls to mitigate those risks, and who are the actors and actions in there? Um, so, highly recommend going to the IT Revolution site, downloading that, and sharing it with your organization and learning about it. But now, getting to the tech. So, as we look at this, one thing we've come to realize as we try to solve this is, in the technical sense, like managing an SDLC or managing your CI/CD pipelines. There's a lot of toil that goes into it. Um, a lot of toil because, frankly, the cognitive load, the responsibility for managing that tends to not tends to be put uh, spread across a lot of engineering teams where now they're always worried about their feature, but they have to worry about so many other aspects of the SDLC that it makes that it makes it reduces the uh, effectivity. So what if there was this, you know, this technology and not agnostic canonical implementation of SDL tooling and workflows that have default workflow implementations? And that allows anyone to layer in current or future unknown concerns, which are independent of any SDLC tool execution. Um, why is this valuable? So you think about like, we'll talk about automated, automated governance, we'll explain it here. It's like, as you have people think about their delivery pipelines, it's like, they'll be like, yeah, I go from Git to Jenkins to whatever. Like, that's a series of tools. That's not a workflow. What if I want to add automated governance in there? I'll explain what it is. How do you do that? Well, now you have to get into the Jenkins DSL. Like, you, there's a lot of overhead. Now, imagine if you have multiple tools um, in your organization that do similar things, say it's Jenkins Technon, GitLab CI, GitHub Actions. Now, how do you enforce that workflow across homogeneously? And now, see, as we start getting into the concept of toil, we talk about audit toil and delivery toil. The fact that that a situation exists is where a lot of the toil and the, 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 the low efficacy comes from. So this is, we have an upstream called Plygos. Um, Plygo, so one of the components is a Plygos step writer, and it is a technology ag uh, agnostic canonical implementation of SDLC tooling, SDLC tooling with default implementations that allow us to layer in concerns. So one concern we've layered in is the automated governance. Um, if you want to check it out, go to github.com forward slash Plygos, P-L-O-I-G-O-S, or you can go to Plygos.io, and there's a, there's a link there as well. Uh, we are working on documentation uh, as as every upstream project probably suffers the most in documentation, we are working on how to uh, and bettering that over time. So always feel free to reach out to us. Um, but really what Plygos does, and let's, let's explain this, is like your CI tool, say it's Jenkins. It has lines and lines and lines of imperative logic. And if anybody has a complex workflow, that that, that Jenkins file can be huge. And sometimes, it's, and most of the time, it's not even unit testable. So what we've done is we actually built Plygo Step as a canonical implementation, making something like Jenkins, we'll just say dumb. At the end of the day, Jenkins delegates to the Plygo Stepper and it says something like, hey, run a static scan, which it says PSR, Plygo Stepper, and a run static scan. What's happening in the background is Plygos is reaching out to a configuration file and saying, okay, what do you mean by static scan? What's the imperative approach to this? And what it does is then that imperative approach, it will reach out and invoke the underlying tool sets. And it will go through and do this for each and every step. So notice what we've done is we've moved the imperative logic out of the, the CI tool itself or the workflow runner into a standard canonical implementation. So if you're invoking you know, Nexus, you're invoking Sonar Cube or whatever it may be, 
the CI tool doesn't have to know how to invoke. They just need to know, hey, run PSR as a static scan or push to repository, and the and then Cligos takes care of itself. This allows you to switch out and homogenize your approach across whether it's multiple workflow runners until you can you know consolidate on one workflow runner if you consolidate. Uh, this is a bit of an eye chart, but what this does is we have some of this there. What this shows you to do is it's going between a bunch of the systems and canonicalizing this, and it stores a lot of information. Um, so there is a there, there's a there's a big I'd like to dig into this deeper, but we got a half hour today, so I'm gonna get moving on to the next thing. Uh, really, what this does is it brings a procedural and declarative approach to how you manage your workflow, and it brings solid principles at the end of the day to managing your SDLC, your SDLC approach, like you would build software. So it's bringing a software engineering approach to your software development lifecycle. Some advantage of this approach is you now have unit tested workflows. You can unit test each of what we call a step runner or like a way to invoke an underlying tool in isolation. You can now run different series of integration tests between these tools. And also what's really neat is you start, we talk about software factories. The idea of CI, CD as a service or platforms um, for internal build and deploy capabilities, this provides an underlying engine for that. So as we go through and think about how it works here, I actually wanna talk a bit about automated governance. So as we're invoking those tools, what we're doing, we added this layer that go ahead and collects, serializes, and persists all the outcomes. So say it runs a Maven, a Maven, uh, a Maven package. We get the unit test outcomes. Everything is as a file. Say we go to SonarCube, we get the SonarCube outcomes. And what we do is we persist all of that. And then what we do is we package that and we sign it and we use our set of SIG store to, to store the attestation. So this is now where we're getting into building provenance of pedigree. So anybody software supply chain background or the software supply chain SBOM, you know, pedigree and provenance is a big deal. What we're able to do when you think about automated governance and we start thinking about the problem is a, an auditor is going to say, hey, where are your sonar queue files? Where is this? Where is that? I want to go through manually and check that. But what we need to do is pull the humans out. The auditors shouldn't be in the middle. They shouldn't be looking through manual files. We can actually automate that with machine readable formats. And this is what this does. And I'll explain how this, how this operates. But what you can do here is now with subs like SIGStore, which uses underlying trust mechanisms that are similar to what's happening to Let's Encrypt, um, Merkle Trees, by the way, check them out, awesome. Uh, it, using that, we can actually establish visibility and trust. And that's the key behind this, is establishing open visibility within the organization to drive that trust. And so how do we make some of this happen? What we do is actually, some of these, they cross-reference each other too. So what we do is you have evidence stored. We sign the, we have evidence that zips. So we take everything, zip it together and store it in a store, something like Nexus as, as, a, as a raw binary. But then what we do is we reference the hash of that inside of the evidence store. So if an auditor wants to go through and they look at this automated audit that's been done, and I'll show you how we do the automated audits. And they say, well, how can I really trust this? Can I really trust that this was the evidence? There now are cryptographic means that you go inside six or just simply ask the question, you know, can this be trusted? And it will tell you whether it's been tampered with or not. And so it makes everything tamper evident. So this is where now you start to, um, with the underlying technology, start to shape, reshape that socio-technical construct where before the, the compliance and audit was going through and just looking at documents and saying, yes, no, that's why it takes 400 hours. And now what you've done is you've automated that. You've worked together to identify procedures that fit within your policy and how to evaluate it and provide a level of trust where it can be automated and you remove what happens in the audit and compliance job from reviewing things to them focusing on, you know, what controls are there? Are these the best controls? Are there better controls? Or really focusing on the state of the security and compliance of the system. Um, how we do this is automating those control gates. So we have really two major activities that, that make this happen. We have an evidence and attestation procedure, and we have a policy enforcement procedure. So in an evidence and attestation, what we do is we just collect the material. We take what are that output scan, whatever those files are, we take it, and we normalize it into this governance API. And I'll explain the governance API here in a second. But then we take the evidence and the governance API, and we sign this, persist the material, and then store the signature um, in, a, in, a, in a structure, SIG store, that can be cryptographically validated. Then we have policy enforcement points. So as you collect this, you collect your evidence you add to, you, and you create your attestations, points along your CI and or CD process, people are gonna wanna enforce the policy and audit. So really what you do is at some point in time, you can go retrieve a policy, retrieve the signed attestations, and you validate it. It's simply comparing it. Hey, here's a machine readable thing of what we've done, and here's how we've attested to it. And you can validate that it's you can validate or invalidate that it that is trustworthy. And then here's the policy, and it's just comparing it. And that's what computers do well. 
So serializing is the key to externalizing the policy. What we're doing here as well is we're externalizing policy application from the tools themselves, like SonarCube, whatever it may be, out to another centralized system. So instead of having SonarCube set up to stop the build, regardless of what it says the policy in SonarCube is, you just let it go through, you take SonarCube's data and you externalize it, which gives you flexibility and also how you apply the policy. Um, another added benefit of this cognitive load. In highly complex organizations, you have hundreds, tens to hundreds of tools that do a lot of this across different tech stacks. The load, the cognitive load to understand these tools in depth to allow to understand their, their policy mechanisms can be large. Now what you're doing is you're reducing it because you're codifying how you translate that into a standard centralized understandable way for your organization. Um, so what you're seeing here is you're seeing, you know, Maven unit test. We simply just take that and then you basically have processors, whether it's Maven, whether it's um, Jasmine, Mocha, you just process and take that, put it into a standard governance API, which you see here on the right-hand side, which just talks about failures, successes, and errors, and anything skipped. And this is what you judge your policy on. Um, here's a bit of what it looks like to actually do it. You can retrieve some of the workflow results. We'll see, let's see here, we get the, there you can retrieve the workflow results, go through, serialize it, retrieve your private key from your signature store. And this is like where SigStore has a, you know, there, there, there's a sort of a PKI that the keys last about 20 minutes or live for 20 minutes. So you retrieve it, you sign your attestations, get rid of your private, the public's up because it's with certificate transparency, it's a basis of certificate transparency in SigStore, your public's up so anybody can use the public to validate the signature, um, and you persist that attestation. So that's what a bit of uh, the step looks like. Now when it comes to auditing, what you can do is you can simply have something like Rego with OPA as a policy engine. You go in there and you just define and say, hey, I want my attestation, my code coverage to be greater than or equal to 80 representing 80%, or I want my cyclomatic complexity to be less than 40. Uh, whatever that may be, you can now start, what you're doing is you're not talking about tools. You're not saying I need Sonar Cube to do this, or I need Fortify to do this, or I need OpenSCAP to do this. What you're saying is you're providing a larger level business abstraction and information data abstraction that says, here's my policy, my process. And you can start saying, we have a pro we have we have a process for uh, policy for cyclomatic complexity. We have a policy for code coverage. Regardless of what the tool is, because all tools will give you that, we go through and say, okay, does the output of the tool, because we have used it in a trusted way, give us it meet our policy? And that's that's where we then start to audit against external interfaces. But now this is where you this is right here. This is compliance as code, policy as code. Like use as many as code buzzwords you want to use. I'm sure more people will invent more. But that's really where the meat of how this operates is. So look at a bit of how this from a sequence diagram is, you know, this is pretty simple. We go through an evidence store at a time of policy, retrieve an attestation, validate it with the public key. Go ahead and request the policy. Um, and then what you can do is you can send the policy and the validated, and, and you can send the validated attestation out to a policy engine. Policy engine returns a result. Did it pass? Did it not pass? You could determine success or failure based upon those types of criteria and then pass that back. And this can either be the hard stop or the soft stop in your delivery process. Again, the power is now you're externalizing and you can give different types of workflows, different types of stops. Say like you're in a, in a dev environment, let it go all the way through most. Like at that point in time, why does it matter if you have a hard stop? Um, what you're looking for is the feedback process. So use those, those lower level processes to get as much feedback as possible. But when you're starting to get in higher level environments or you're deploying and getting into where somebody's going to consume this or multiple people consume it, now you can have hard stops based upon whether it does or does not meet policy. Um, one thing you're doing, though, is you're not breaking the build. You're letting the builds go all the way through. You're using your policy. You're using the automated governance as a way to enforce the next steps at specific policy enforcement. Now what this do, what this does is brings continuous integration as evidence. So you can go through like your static scans, your signing container images and use this to collect, generate and publish and sign your evidence. This now becomes the evidence for subsequent processes, which then turns other things like say continuous, de uh, continuous deployment as well into a, as an auditable process, but this is where it gets completely um, automated too. You can audit the attestations before you even start your deployment processes. And based upon that audit, you continue or don't continue. Now, the beauty is the outcome of this deployment process also generates more material, which generates evidence, which generates other um, attestations. And you can use that as you go up through higher level environments. Whoops. You can use that as you go to higher level environments. So the idea is, could you do 100% automated commit to production? If you have automated governance, your testing capabilities are good. Like at the end of the day, like a lot of this too is based upon, can you unit test well? 
Do you have integration tests? Um, do you have a good automated test suite? And if you have all the automated aspects where you usually have a lot of that manual toil, then there's no reason you can't go from commit to production with 100 with 100 uh, 100% automated while reducing your risk simultaneously. Now, imagine this as we talked through the whole syncing that ideal process. This technically could be your process. If it takes you four hours to get from idea to commit, well, then if this only takes 10 minutes, like you're in production in four hours and 10 minutes, um, and you're getting the efficacy of what the underlying governance mechanism requires. Because the governance isn't bad, governance is good. It's just our implementation um, yields not just inefficient, but ineffective approaches. So with that being said, um, some key architectural here to take away, externalizing policy. So your policy is independent of tools you want to pull it out. Um, you want to target, you want to look at these tools and your underlying components as trusted agents. How do you build them as trusted independent agents so they can collect a test on your behalf and then enforce these policies? Um, what this does is observability. It's more important to know what cannot be validated as opposed to what's passing or failing. I share like a story, we talk a bit about this in the book where you've got red, green, and black. Like red tells you it's failing, green tells you it's passing, but black just tells you you don't know whether it's failing or passing. That right there, those simple pieces of visual information can drive behavior changes to at least to get to a state of known. There should be a large, there should be not, there should be no unknown unknowns. You should get to a state where it's known. We're either red or I'm either green. Cause then from there you can get and fix, uh, and, and fix your approach. Um, also convergence, distilling your processes, tools, and policies and procedures for reusable concerns. Um, I always talk about the Netflix on road. What you want to do with this is you offer these as ways as a, is that you offer these in your organization as an on road. If you do this, you abide by this, the, the set of constraints in a specific way, then from commit to production is very easy. If not, well, it's not that you can't get to production. It's simply that you just have to go through that 400 hour process. With that being said, I want to thank everybody here today. Um, I can go through a little from the tech show with the implementation. A lot of this happens in the background. I know with the Dev Nation crowd, I'd like to see a lot of IDEs and code, and that was a lot of slideware. Um, but if you have any questions or whatnot, or if you ever want to reach out, we can always talk more about this and show how it's implemented. Do go to the, uh, you can always go out to the Plygos, um, the Plygos GitHub, check it out there, check out the step rudder. We've got default implementations for GitLab, uh, GitLab, Tecton, and Jenkins uh, with our three standard workflows from our minimal to what we call standard and then to everything, which is the automated governance. Um, so with that being said, I don't take questions. We just have conversations. Let's talk about it. Any mm -hmm. questions? Already had any conversations? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I had a couple of questions, but I think you just answered one because you've shown a Jenkins example. I was going to ask if you have like implementation for other kinds of pipelines, and it appears so, right? Yeah, we got Tectile, we get Lab, we've got Jenkins. Um, we are looking for GitHub Actions, and so if anybody in the community wants to contribute up and learn more about contributing, um, by all means, GitHub Actions. If you're looking at Bitbucket, whatever it may be, we have a pretty clear way. Our documentation is lacking, but we do have a pretty clear way of onboarding new, um, new, new uh, CI tools. Mm -hmm. And another question is that uh, uh, you've shown some YAML. That's the, probably the configuration for Plygos. And, but how, how do you make it work? Like, because I also mentioned like you had like, for example, a Maven build and it needs to be executed inside the step runner of Plygos. So can you leverage all the, like the, the building extensions of your CI pipeline or does it need to be a specific implementation of Plygos? So yeah, this, what this does is you're not using any, uh, you're not using any, um, any of your extensions necessarily inside of your, your CI tool. So if you've got an extensions for Jenkins or something, you're not using the extension. Uh, what I'll show you here is, is like generate metadata or it says Maven. Um, this is for a, this is actually for a Java build. Uh, the ply, the plugin itself is the, what we refer to the step implementer inside of Plygo. So that is the plugin. And what you're doing is you're, you're removing dependencies upon your CI tools and the CI tool ecosystem to its degree, to a degree and putting that dependency up, up on this, this, this abstraction. Um, the beauty behind this is you can, if you want to do the same workflow for something and go from Java to JavaScript, you could switch Maven out for NPM. And now all of a sudden you're doing the exact same thing all over the place that you're doing for your Java, the same workflow, but you're using it for um, a, a Java script based app, whether it's Node or Angular, React. Um, you know, did I answer the question there? I want to make sure that uh, whoever answered that question, if I was able to answer it clearly. Yeah, so from the point of view of the CI pipeline, you would have like one single step, which is the plug of step runner. 
and that's it. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, yes-ish. Um, actually, um, let me say again. So on Jenkins, what you do, uh, I can actually, let me try to pull up a Jenkins example here. On Jenkins, what you actually do is you have multiple steps. Each of these in Jenkins, what it would look like, like generate metadata is a step. So what you'd be doing in the in in in, group, in the, the Jenkins DSL is you just go in and say PSR generate metadata and you, you pass in what the configuration file is, and the configuration file has all these implementations. So for this for this specific workflow, it's implementing this Maven implementer, and getting semantic versioning. Um, so it would go through and do all this, but it'd actually be one, two, three, four, five, as you see in this example. It would be five steps inside of something like Jenkins. Uh, now, in something like Tecton, because every task in Tecton is its own container, what you'd probably do is you'd have different task references, and you may have like one aggregate CI task that would then call generate metadata, and generate metadata would then invoke these underlying implementers. Um, does that make sense? Let me, uh, I'm going to find the, the Jenkins library just mm -hmm. to give you an example of what it looks like. I'll switch it. Yeah, so if I were a Jenkins user, I could see like a one-on-one -on -one mapping between each one of those steps and uh, the Jenkins steps. Is that correct? Exactly. So what you're seeing here is, for example, you see in, in the stage continuous integration, we have a stage called generate metadata. So we'll go in here and then we'll find the PSR. We pass in a config file and then it says step generate metadata. So what what Group, what Jenkins or the CI tool doesn't know, it doesn't know any imperative information around generate metadata. It just knows it needs to generate metadata. And this is the beauty because now you can centralize your implementations for your organization. And then going back to, let me go back to this tab real quick. You'll see the metadata is, you know, this implementer for Maven. Um, this is pulling out some, some information um, around the actual, like, the jar itself. Then you're running Git, which is getting information around the commit, the hashes. And then you're running the semantic version implementer, which then is bumping and managing the versions. You could have multiple implementers here for how you implement in your organization and generate metadata. Um, but this is our default way of doing it. So you technically could have four or five more implementers if you have something specific for your organization to do it. And the beauty behind this is because this is an abstraction, um, you're not changing any of your underlying, as you change your business logic, which the business logic is, you know, the sequence of implementers and the, impl and the implementations themselves. As you change your business logic, you don't have to change anything in your workflow tools unless you're adding or removing a step. But, uh, and that when I say a set, something generate metadata or tag source at the highest level, but you could go in and modify this and now you have encapsulation of your workflow and encapsulation of the specific tax, tasks inside of the workflow itself, which is, this is sort of the power of it is being able to manage. Cause I like, guess people know, and I'll go back to this Jenkins file. Like, you know, this is, this, this one's big. Imagine as you have a hundred to 200 apps and you have to change your workflow. Everybody's been in an organization at one point in time. They're like, I got to go update so many Jenkins files or so many CI files just to do this one thing. And then there becomes a risk versus reward trade off at the end of the day. And so, what we've done is you're reducing the friction to doing this and not making it so there is a trade off or reducing that trade off to where it's negligible. So, I'll stop right there. I know I went a bit of a little track, but if that did that answer the individual's question? Uh, yes. And uh, one last one, uh, from your experience, how long does it take for like a team to be able to adopt like uh, this two in their pipelines? Ah, so um, it's, uh, it's, it depends how open and how easy is the team to work with. As you're taking this, what you're doing is you're basically telling the development teams and the folks that who may be tightly coupled to their tool sets and their opinions about their tools, you're, you're telling them to let their hands go a bit. So if that's an easy conversation in your organization, you could be up and running in minutes with something like this. We have the reference implementations, the approaches. So you technically could be up and running in minutes with it. Um, the thing is how the, me the, the next big hurdle is how does the organization manage this over time? This is not a con common model at all. Centralizing these capabilities, um, providing this as a service is in some organizations, but it's not common. And that's where the adoption over time, that's the question. Um, actually, we've we've uh, we something similar to this model that we put in the book um, with some of the, the authors. What they showed is over a year, they went from very low um, very low rates of their compliance, like unit tests, to very high just by having this information. Um, so um, technically, it's not hard to get implemented to get up and running. Um, 
and if your workflow is not changing on a day-to-day -day basis, then you know it's fairly static and you can update, upgrade over time easily. Um, but if you have an organization that's so tightly coupled to their underlying workflows for the delivery process and they feel like they need to be in the imperative implementation and they're just not, they're, they're not ones that just want this as a platform service, that right there then becomes how you, the, the, the time is how you restructure that new socio-technical um, agreement between you and that organization. Um, so hopefully that stands right there. That's not the that's not the clearest answer, but this comes into like it's more the human factor than the technical factor. If you want the technical question, you know, maybe a couple hours if you're you're coming from scratch. Um, you want the human question? Well, you know, got an open organization could be quick. Got a fairly closed organization. Um, good luck. I want to hear how it goes for you. <laughs> Cool. That's the typical consultant answer. Like it depends uh, because it's true, right? It depends. Uh, yeah. So yeah, we don't have any more questions. So I'd like to thank you, Bill, for this amazing presentation. I hope like every, uh, we got a lot of people interested in Employagos. And well, if you have any other interesting subjects, we would love to have you back here at Dev Nation. Absolutely. Thanks for the time today. Yeah. Thank you, and for our friends watching right now, see you in our next DevNation offering.